loving our neighbor in the midst of a multi-faith world, or as Dan Weiss so eloquently titled it, three white guys talking about religious tolerance and diversity. Yeah. Uh, Connor, Connor is not able to be here today, uh, but we'll be here with his good friend Ian Shira next week to really uh, have space to ask uh, questions and to have some dialogue with um, a practice practicer of Islam. Um, I'm really hot now. We'll find a medium level there. Um, and so I uh, want to catch up a little bit from last week, uh, but also uh, get to some new pieces as well today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the theology and the Bible and, and exclusive, inclusive, pluralistic, where are we on this spectrum? Um, and, and we'll talk about that. We maybe reach some conclusions. We might not. Uh, but I wanted to start with this video, maybe. <coughs> um, and this video is, uh, was just out a few uh, months ago, right after the Paris bombings, um, and it's in Dutch. Um, so there are subtitles for you, um, but it's very, very fascinating, and it's called The Quran Project. And um, I just want to start this to whet our appetites and, and see, uh, just check your thoughts as you're watching. So let's try this, see if it works. Door de recente gebeurtenissen in Parijs en de associatie tussen ISIS en de islam heeft het islamitische geloof steeds vaak onder vuur. Zo worden moslims ervan beschuldigd dat hun geloof niet aansluit op onze westerse idealen. Het geloof dat op onze cultuur grotendeels gebouwd is. Een vrouw moet zich laten bewijzen in stilheid in alle onderdanigheid. Volgens de hele boek is de vrouw uh, in principe onderdanig. Voor dit experiment hebben we een bijbel gekocht en deze omgetoverd tot een Koran. Hierin hebben we schokkende passages gehighlight die sterk in contrast staan met onze westerse normen en waarden. Eens kijken wat er gebeurt als we de citaat uit de Bijbel voorleggen aan de mensen op straat, maar ze in een voorstelling laten dat ze uit de Koran komen. Als u mijn veroordelingen verwerkt en als uw ziel van mijn bepaling uw walk, zult dan het vlees van uw eigen zonen eten en het vlees van uw eigen dochters zult u eten. Want ik sta niet toe dat de vrouw onderwijs geeft. Dan moet u haar hand afhakken. Laat uw oog haar niet ontzien. Wanneer een man met een andere man slaapt, zij moeten zeker tot de dood gebracht worden. Wat uh, is jullie eerste reactie? Ik vind het belachelijk. Nou, ik wist eigenlijk helemaal niet zo dat dit ook uh, ja, erin stond. Hoe kan je hierin geloven? Ongelooflijk vind ik dat eigenlijk. Handen afhakken en zo, ja, zo zijn ze bij bang, maar ik... Uh... Als je vanaf je geboorte al zo wordt opgevoed met zulke gedachten, dan ga je toch op een bepaalde manier denken. Dit komt over alsof uh, ze weer willen onderdrukken en willen onderwerpen aan hun geloof. Die vrouw wil helpen en als dank uh, wordt de hand afgehakt, dus... Uh... Ja, zo is het. Ja. Dat is niet goed, hè? Nee. Als je dit nou naast de Bijbel zou zetten, wat, wat zijn er dan voor jou de grootste verschillen? Ik vind de Koran, zeg maar, als ik dit zo hoor, die vind ik uh, iets, uh, iets agressiever met de uh, hakte hand eraf. Ik denk dat de Bijbel toch ook positieve dingen heeft. Ze uh, vertellen het anders, in ieder geval. Het grootste verschil is dat wat hier, wat hier ook expliciet blijkt uit veel meer de rol van de vrouw. In de Bijbel staat het er iets minder hard erop, gewoon iets vredeachtiger. Ja, de beeld verandert en uh, ik vind dat ze toch wel een beetje mee moeten gaan. De meeste mensen van ons hebben gewoon ja, vrijheid van keuze en vrijheid van meningsuiting gehad. Ja. En daardoor kan je, ga je op een andere manier denken. Ik vind het erg dat wat ooit opgeschreven is, men als de waarheid ziet. Maar zou dit boek dan niet gewoon weg kunnen laten? Uh, nou ja, het is al heel oud hè, dus het hoort er een beetje bij, ja. Nou, dan hebben we een kleine verrassing voor jou. Want deze prachtige zin uit de Koran. Ik kan me gewoon rustig uit de Bijbel. Wat? Sorry, we hebben dat. Ik zeg altijd van, je moet niet vooroordelen, maar zelf doe ik het ook alleen maar. En het is iets wat je niet bewust doet. Om met de media te maken natuurlijk. Ik blijf er gewoon bij, ik blijf gewoon rationeel nadenken. Ik kijk gewoon wat een beetje logisch is en, en doe, er je, doe er je voordeel mee. Natuurlijk heb ik vroeger ook uh, bijbevalen gehoord <coughs> en ik heb zelf christelijke school gezeten. Maar nee, ik had niet verwacht dat dit nee. erin <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry about the colorful part. <laughs> I guess we're all human, right? Uh, so, what are your thoughts? Surprising? Not surprising? Not surprising. What? What does it? What does it say about how we interact with, um, you know, 
lot of ignorance. <laughs> There's a lot of ignorance? <laughs> yes, perhaps about biases. what's in the Bible. There's a lot of bias. There's a lot of implicit bias, that if it's something violent, it must be in the Quran. Yeah. You know, there was no one said, this isn't in the Quran. But if someone read us something, you know, we might say, oh, that's not in the Bible, you know, that, that there was a, a kind of willingness to accept it as it was at face value. Um, I thought that the Quran being more aggressive was an interesting uh, judgment by one of the one of the hearers. I just found it a really, a really fascinating uh, piece of. Uh, it, it, I'm not sure what to make of it, but I thought that would be a good way for us to start um, our conversation as we go about loving our neighbor. Um, Dan has started this trend, uh, and I like it, of talking about some religion in the news. Um, and there's a couple of places this week, uh, as I mentioned in the sermon, or as I will mention in the sermon, <laughs> depending on your service time. Uh, the Pope this week uh, came out and said, uh, I know Time Magazine read it, that, that he hopes people give up intolerance, uh, indifference for Lent. Um, thoughts about that? Wonderful. Yeah. Go Pope. <laughs> Just for Lent. Mm. Just for Lent, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 21 days to build a habit, right? <laughs> That's right, yeah. Um, I wanted to read a little part of what he wrote. He, um, he comes up with this term called the globalization of indifference. And I think a lot of what we were talking about over these three weeks is a bigger concern now for us because we live in such a globalized world. So that we, throughout our lives, will come into contact with more people of other faiths than any other point in history, I think, uh, simply because of the way the globalization works. And, and Pope Francis seems to think that globalization also helps to breed more indifference. He writes, whenever our interior life becomes caught up in its own interests and concerns, there is no longer room for others, no place for the poor, God's voice is no longer heard, and the quiet joy of God's love is no longer felt. We end up being incapable of feeling compassion at the outcry of the poor, weeping for other people's pain, and feeling a need to help them, as though all this were someone else's responsibility and not our own. I thought those were pretty <laughs> condemning, <laughs> convicting uh, words about about how it can feel to be part of the world. Um, and he goes on to say that Lent is the perfect time to learn how to love again. Um, he said, but if you want to change your heart, a harder fast is needed. So that might say more than 40 days. Um, and he goes, this narrow road is gritty, but it isn't sterile. And I think that, that we see that in Paul a lot too, that the road of the way of Jesus is one that doesn't have um, nearly as, uh, it's not nearly as scot-free as we might hope or desire or have, have grown to learn. So that was in the news this week, religiously. Um, the other story, I wanted to see if there's any feedback or opinion or people want to talk about um, Wheaton College, not far from us. Um, this week, uh, it was over the weekend, last weekend, uh, the administration, a little bit of backstory. Um, one of their tenured professors um, wore a hijab, a Muslim headscarf, in solidarity um, with uh, people practicing Islam after the Paris attacks. Uh, Wheaton is a predominantly, uh, I would say, evangelical uh, Christian college. Um, I have lots of family <laughs> who have gone there. And, um, and they said, and this professor, Dr. Hawkins, said in a conversation that Muslims and Christians worship the same God. And for that, she was put on leave and um, essentially punished for that. Um, and uh, Wheaton College has been in the news for that. Um, so I don't know if it's a story many people are familiar with. Um, <coughs> thoughts, questions, reflections. There's a really good article on Sojourners. Um, about it and talks about how um, it, it's a turning point for many evangelical Christians um, as to how exclusively they view interfaith work and, and to what extent. It also plays into it that this professor is a woman and she's African American. Um, so there's lots of, oh. there's lots of subtext, but we won't 
we won't try to figure out the oppression Olympic winner, um, <laughs> but there but there is a sense that um, there's been lots of grassroots support. In fact, um, one of the professors at LSTC went this week and fasted on Ash Wednesday at Wheaton with about 40 others um, in support of of this professor. So, um, so that was a little closer to home. How about the one where the Muslims wanted to pray during work time? Yeah, that's been in the news too at Aaron's. They've just fired some folks. Yeah, there's legal issues there about not giving time for a Muslim prayer. That That's right here in Wisconsin, right here in our, I don't know which suburb it is. Washington, I think. Is it? Yeah. No, it's where you are. But but they have a, you know that um, be careful what snowblower you use right no I don't know <laughs> um, but it's the Aaron's company but um, yeah what do people think of that of that I'm not going to speak authoritatively on it so. <laughs> well that's not showing tolerance at all. Yeah, it's a little bit opposite of, of that, isn't it? Yeah. Woo! <laughs> I don't want to break the podium. Yeah, her. I've worked in that setting, and there are two sides to that story. Mm -hmm. uh, there certainly are two sides to that story. In a, a modern assembly line, the practicality of it. Yeah, there's a piece of practicality. Yeah, it is not one, some are portraying it as they're just trying to persecute the Muslims. That's not the case at all. There's there are two sides of that story. Mm -hmm. yeah, On the flip side, Jerome Foods up in Barron, which has a huge Somali Muslim population, has been able to accommodate with no problem. No, but they're processing food, not making snowblowers in the industrial process. Well, they're still they're totally processing out of line. I think yeah. part of it, too, I think Arians for a period of time allowed the practice that now they've decided not to allow it. No. And that, yeah, I, I, they tried I, and it didn't work. I'm less familiar with this this new story, which is going to be brought up. <laughs> um, Lois, yeah. I was just thinking that if you are committed to prayer, you can certainly do that without disrupting everyone around you. I uh, look at that kind of um, like a show that this is my religion and this is what I'm going to do, rather than what is a practical matter for what your work life should be. Huh. Yeah, I've been in a couple of different meetings. I'm on the Interfaith Conference Board. <laughs> um, shameless plug this Thursday night. Um, they're having a, a, it's in the pink section of the announcements, they're having a forum on, on uh, Islam, and um, I think <coughs> Sikhs involved as well. Um, I don't remember the details because I forgot to bring my bulletin with me. But um, the Elm, Elm Grove yes. with Women's no Elm Grove Sunset, 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 Sunset PM. Yeah. seven p.m. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I would encourage you to go if this is something that interests you. And and, and um, but in some of my meetings there, we've had a number of people in the middle of the meeting step out and, and lay down their prayer rug and pray and and so it's a different sense of um, commitment I think than Christian prayer, uh, a little bit more. Uh, again, maybe we can ask Ian Shira um, next week, but, but my sense is it's a little bit more regimented. Michelle and Don. I don't have like a specifically strong opinion on whether, like I don't know the details of how their operation goes, but I think one of the things that you run, could potentially run into, whether you just tell people to suck it up or not, are people who are not taking that time for prayer, having to cover that time and being like, I want, you know, in their mind, it's an extra break, right? Whether, regardless of what it's for. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that this is like a silly example, but like when I was in college and I was a bartender, you got a break if you went downstairs to smoke. Uh -huh. So guess what I started doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I mean, like, I'm so silly, but like I think back to like, why did I smoke back then? Like I wasn't really like addicted. I didn't do it outside of work, but it was because I wanted that break with everyone else that was going to take a smoke. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was, it's kind of like you have to look, balance it in that way too. And um, this is a phrase that like we don't let our kids say, but that whole, it's not fair. Like, it's not fair that they get to go take this time, and I don't get time to go do peaceful reflection by myself. You know, it's a, I think it's a slippery slope in some cases. But isn't it better to have a prayer than a smoke? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's constitutionally, I'm not sure how that works. People may say no, but I need my cigarette, you know. I mean, I was going to say, I work at a bookstore, and we've made it work pretty easily. It just comes 
and smoke breaks too. It comes out at you have a certain amount of break time for lunch. If you're going on a smoke break, you take 10 minutes off your lunch. If you have, a, and we've had the most ones, and you, if you have a prayer break, it's, it's 15 minutes. And just like if you need someone to spot you at the register because you have to go to the bathroom, you spot somebody at the register to go take a break. So there's a place maybe to be an ally. Yeah. If you're in a workplace where, where that's happening, it's, hey, I'll cover you. you know. yeah. but, uh, Diane? Um, no, I, but I mean, it's the same thing. You have a line of people who are waiting to be checked out, and someone steps up and takes your place. And you schedule it. It's because it's every day, whatever time. Well, I think so with, the, with, oh, I John, with Muslims, I think it's, um, I mean, it's a, it's a particular time, which I think has made it more difficult for um, the assembly line kind of factory setting. I have an entodontist who is Muslim, and um, when I was teaching, I could never go until like five in the afternoon, and he would often say, okay, I'm going to take a little break now and go say my prayers, and I will be back, and then we'll continue. And I mean, that was fine with me, but in, I mean, he was able, he built his office to accommodate that and I guess if you didn't like it you wouldn't go back. You know, yeah. go with your feet. Done. I um my last fourteen years with the county was in bridges and structures and our structural lead engineer, his name was Mahmoud Malas. He was born in Syria and after nine one one we sat down and had a long talk about how we were alike rather than how we were different. Mm -hmm. But when he, he did um, work his schedule for his prayers, he told me, around his work schedule. He would pray in the morning before he came, he would close his door at lunch hour, and then he would go home at five o'clock, or what, however his schedule mm -hmm. served, and then he would pray uh, several times at home. But, um, and he taught the Quran at the, at the, and I believe he still does at the mosque on 13th Street. Yeah. And uh, after 911, he said, Islam does not teach killing women and children, only other people during the war. He said, those people that did that, he says, are not true Muslim. And yeah, and we see that just been sort of decrying also with a lot of the ISIS uh, yeah. pieces as well. The Islamic Society here in Milwaukee is really good about putting out press releases. Um, their website is very good um, about really just saying, nope, uh, these aren't our people. Um, much like if someone may be an extremist and say they're, you know, Christian. The difference is we don't, as Christians, often have to say, those aren't our people. You know, so there, there's a difference in, in that, but, um, you know, that, that we might have to, you know, and. And sometimes, you know, uh, most people may not know that Dylan Roof, the Charleston shooter, was a member of an ELCA church. You know, and so there it was a place where, you know, so there's places where, where we have to, have to own those connections and places where, uh, with a lot of the Islamic extremists, um, many Islamic societies and mosques are saying, this is, this is someone going rogue. Um, the other problem is with that, going back, not to feed the issue over there, that Aaron situation, that branch of Islam, according to one article I read, their prayer schedule changes with the setting and rising of the sun. So it makes it even more difficult to integrate. Yeah. So all the things to learn about. Yeah, John. Uh, back in the Twin Cities years ago, I used to work uh, refueling aircraft. Uh, and uh, we had a number of Muslims. And they had issues that uh, they worked their prayer time, the majority of them worked their prayer time around the aircraft because when an aircraft came in, you had to fuel it, and that's just that it was. And the Muslims that kind of bucked the system and said, we want to have our prayers now, the existing Muslims came to them and said, no, no, we have to assimilate because they were afraid that all the Muslims would be painted with the same, you know, with the same brush and they would be discriminated against hiring more Muslims. Yeah, Darla, and then I, I want to get to some, some of my stuff. But go ahead. Yeah, this has been a good discussion. I think it's great. Several years ago, while traveling in Egypt, we had a long discussion with uh, our tour director about about Islam and the prayers and the whole bit. We started asking some of the questions like people in the professions. You've got a doctor who's a surgeon who happens to be in surgery during the middle of prayer time. And he goes, 
Prayer is obligatory for those of us who are not holding someone else's life in their hands at the time. So the doctors had a dispensation so that they could take their prayer at a different time because they were holding somebody else's life in their hands. But for the rest of them, they have an obligation to abide by the Quran of the, four, of the five prayers per day. So obviously Diane's endodontist did not feel her life was in. <laughs> 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 that's, my, that's my chewing ability. <laughs> yeah. Just, um, just real quick, why do you think that the Christian faith does not do what the Muslims do and basically if someone does something horrible, they discount that? I mean, there's plenty of, you know, people that are fundamentalist type supposed Christians, which I would question, why isn't there? I mean, you know, like the killing of the doctors for Planned Parenthood, things like that. I mean, I don't see a huge, you know, Christian population saying how wrong that is to kill somebody else for, you know, whether you believe or not. I mean, that's wrong. Uh, I, I, I'm going to shoot from the hip here. I'm not sure exactly. But, but yeah, I think a lot of it might have to do with the that Christianity is seen as the majority religion and so I wonder if there's not an expectation or an understanding or an assumption that people understand I don't think we do <laughs> uh, I'm not saying that we shouldn't address those things but I wonder if um, so much like um, much like I might never have to I might never have to feel or call into question or or apologize, I mean, I should apologize for being male. <laughs> um, a lot of the time, I'm not always aware of those places. Um, so I wonder if it's not connected to some Christian privilege in the religion world that says, you know, we're, people, people under, you know, Everybody knows. we assume people know that there's less skepticism or dubiousness about our religious practice. That's changing a little bit, but but that's my sense. I don't know. That's a that's a rough shot. Diane and then well, Lois and, and then and Pat. Then I, I think that's what makes the Wheaton College situation so interesting is that you have two Christian people, um, you know, both the professor and the college are Christian, and that's what made the whole thing such an interesting situation, and you know, kind of. Uh, an illustration of the whole divisiveness that there is. Yeah, yeah. and we'll talk a little bit about um, some, of the, some of the perspectives that get behind what's happening at Wheaton and what happens for, I think, all of us as we try to figure out how are we Christian and how do we deal with interfaith relationships. Uh, Lois and then Pat. I think that much of, our, um, much of our thinking is determined by how the media portrays things and what they emphasize in their um, newspapers and television and um, newscasts. And, and I don't think the media chooses to emphasize too much uh, what, when a Christian does something, but they do run <coughs> with the ball, they run the whole gamut if something is done by a Muslim. I, I think there's good experiences to that, absolutely. We'll let Dan take the media questions next week. Uh, <laughs> uh, Pat. In all of this, one of the hardest things for me is when do we judge, when do we not judge? How mm -hmm. horrific does the act have to be? Do we never judge? God tells us not to. So that's a hard one. You yes. never walk, you, you never, it can be the most horrific crime in the world and we have not blocked that person's walk. How do we judge? Um, you know, Lent is a time where I always think God's message is so simple. He sent his son out of love and forgiveness. Go forth and live that life. The Lord tells you. So. Preach. <laughs> uh, Don, and then uh, Herb, and then I want to get into this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. This is great. I, I mean, yeah, I, I, you're testing my patience in a really good way. <laughs> my fiance would be so proud of me. She's like, you always just talk at them. You never let them say what they think or feel. Uh, well, I, I think our feelings, too, are, are a reflection of how much we are involved with whatever the situation is. Undocumented workers right now is a big thing on the political forefront. And the wall that 
Trump wants to build and so on. But we're not as concerned about immigrants who are not here legally and so on. But if you go to Arizona or some of the states where they see that as a problem because they have situations there that are causing them some problems that we don't have. Uh, the Pope got involved with it in Mexico this past week, which of course said that the Donald then of course accused him of being political. But <laughs> there he, he was trying to say, look, we, we have to allow these people to be themselves and be their, their, their us. And beyond yeah, their us, but we don't have the same reaction because we're not part sometimes of what it is that's being affected. Yeah, just like in the video, context is everything, right? <laughs> um, and so that that where we are, our social location, our 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 location in terms of our geography, all of those things play into it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Herb, then Carl, and then I'm going to claim some time. <laughs> we, we are talking about being more ecumenical, understanding the Islam faith. Some of us see it as we're all worshiping the same God, and yet we have to also respect the parts of our own Christian community that have, are, are looking at, thou shalt have no other gods before thee. Who is the real God? Is this God of Islam the real God? And some of our Christian brothers and sisters severely question that, and we have to respect them and understand their point of view also, and not say you, you're wrong because you're not liberal enough or whatever we want to put on it, and we have to understand that. And when we look at the case, the situation at Wheaton, look at there are some groups that are coming from a little different part of Christianity, and we don't say they're going to hell. Yeah, that's a, that's a complex stuff. Uh, I don't know if we can unpack it all now, but but I would say that uh, one this semantic change <laughs> um, that ecumenism, ooh, I have a message, um, has to do with <laughs> other Christians. So our ecumenical relationships are us and Catholics, us and Presbyterians, <laughs> Lutherans and Moravians. I love Moravians, by the way. Um, and interfaith is, is what, what we're really talking about here. So th that's just a, oftentimes they get thrown together, and so I wanna make sure we're, we're as far as that goes. And I think that um, this is hard because I think if we were to take a survey, and we might later, depending on how the room feels, um, just to, a long continuum from very exclusively Christian to very inclusively open to everything, we would be everywhere along the spectrum. That's my guess. Um, and there's no one of those that is right or wrong. Um, what I'm going to offer is maybe we think about it in a different way um, than either of those poles <laughs> along the way. So that's my hope that we'll get to today is, What's, what's maybe another alternative? And I, I steal this from Brian McLaren, um, who I think has, has a good idea, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Because um, I think that as a, as a congregation, as a community, we're never going to be <laughs> able to say, boom, here's where we are. Um, but I think that there are some things that in our own individual um, decision-making about what is our theology of this, and guess what, theologians, have been fighting about this for a long time. Some of the dirtiest theological fights are about <laughs> this topic. <laughs> Interfaith, salvation, Jesus, is Jesus necessary, is Jesus not necessary? How does this all work? All the questions Herb's asking, there are some of the most fierce and angry and hatred filled theology anywhere than between people on different sides of these poles. And so I think that really calls us to look for what's, what's in the mid, what's transversing all of this? that might give us, as people of faith, uh, an alternative that allows us to be where we are, uh, but also to find a way to act with humanity and, and see human dignity in people of all religions. So that's my goal for the next 22 minutes. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> um, a little bit of where I'm coming from, I think is important. I wanna lay my cards on the table um, in that, um, my good friend and mentor, Murray Haar, um, I've talked about him before, he's my Jewish, Lutheran Jewish professor. Um, he was one of my uh, formative teachers at Augustana in Sioux Falls. Um, his parents survived the Holocaust. Um, he became a Lutheran pastor in midlife and now is Jewish again. Um, his, his main mantra always was think, 
ellipsis, dot, 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 that you may be wrong. And I think for me, whenever it comes to talking about Christians' relationship to other faiths, that's my mantra. I'm going to think about it. I want to be thoughtful. But I, I got to keep in mind that I might not be right. <laughs> um, and so I think that that's a, that's a good uh, place of humility for me, if I can be non-humble and brag about my humility. Um, <laughs> but that definitely informs the way I approach talking about this and thinking about interfaith relationships. Um, for me, um, I like to think I am neither an exclusivist nor an inclusivist. <laughs> I like to call myself a confessional pluralist. And you might say, what the heck is a confessional pluralist? Uh, this comes from a, a United Church of Christ theologian um, named Tyrone Inbody. Um, and, and he came up with this term, and I, I stole it and adapted it for my own life. And that is saying, to be confessional is to confess Jesus as Lord. It's what Paul's talking about in our New Testament lesson today. He's saying, if you confess Jesus you know, as Lord... That means Caesar is not. That means my wallet is not. That means Buddha is not Lord. It doesn't mean Buddha might not have enlightenment. It doesn't mean Buddha might not have good teaching. But it means that I'm confessing Jesus as Lord and maybe Savior. Um, so I would say God loves the world. I would say God, God's intent is to bring creation to fruition in a new way, what we might call the reign of God or the kingdom of God. Um, and I would say that, that Jesus um, is not salvific in and of his, himself. It's Jesus as part of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, that represents salvation. So, so Jesus doesn't do it on his own. <laughs> Jesus needs the other parts of the Trinity, God and the Spirit, to be saving. Um, and that's different than what a Muslim would say about Jesus. Um, or it's different than what a Jew might say about Jesus. It's very different from what a, uh, a Baha'i person would say about Jesus. But what Inbody says, this is why confessional, so that's my confession. I need Jesus. Um, but I also see there's a plurality, there's a, a multitude of other religious experiences. Um, and for me, Mine only makes sense if I have a Christian story and Christian words, like Trinity. Um, I studied in Germany with a, with a Muslim named Osama, and he um, uh, was not a terrorist. Um, and he was flabbergasted by this Christian Trinity. He could not figure it out for the life of him. And really, he's like... You believe in three gods, not one. You know? And so we had a really good, fruitful dialogue about that. And so it, it revealed to me, wait a second, my belief, my confession only makes sense because I have Christian language to talk about it. And if I tried to explain my Christian language to someone who wasn't Christian, it might sound like a bunch of crazy gobbledygook. Um, and so uh, what I want to say is, as a Christian, I think Jesus is normative and decisive, and it's the way that we experience God in humanity. It's the way we can know about God. But I can't say that that's the way everyone knows about God. And part of that for me, then, is chalking the rest up to mystery. Um, there's a great theologian named Robert Bella who says, we'll let God deal with the rest. <laughs> but my own belief is that that God is powerful enough, all, I mean, God uses all <coughs> creation, all humankind in lots of places in the Bible. So to me, that that's a place where I'm going to let God do God's thing, and I believe in a God who has power to do whatever God will do at the end of time. And that frees me from having to worry about if my Muslim friend is going to heaven or not. Maybe that's a, maybe that's a cop-out. <laughs> we can talk about that if it is. But for me, that's what I mean by confessional pluralism. There's lots of other religions, um, and, and God will do what God will do, but I have my unique experience. Now, on the other hand, so that's, those are my cards on the table. Um, so that tends to be a little bit more universal than it is particular. On the one hand, I think Dan introduced these last week, kind of exclusivism, right? Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, nothing else. Can you guys think of any... Um, 
What are some benefits of being exclusive when it comes to interfaith thought? I think there are some benefits. Um, Dan Bice, uh, as we met to talk about this, said, oh, I think there's some definite benefits because I grew up in this world. <laughs> um, can you guys think of any benefits to being um, or to having or thinking exclusively? Because there's probably some of us among the group that would say, I think Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that's it. Um, what are some benefits of that that you can think of? You don't have to worry that you've made the wrong decision. <laughs> you don't have to worry, yeah. There's a sense of cer certainty. You're right because you're right. Yeah, yeah. Good direction. direction. Yeah. That's, uh, I think that's right. Rita? You don't have to be wishy-washy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a that good point mean. because being wishy-washy is a sin in America. <laughs> in America, not in the church. <laughs> that's a sin. <laughs> Uh, to be open-minded and wish you wish you. Well, I guess I'm not, and I'm not saying that that's, um, I also see the negative of being exclusive. So well, we'll get to that, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, well, okay, it's comfortable. Mm -hmm. It can be comfortable, yeah. Um, yeah, things that Dan noted uh, as being positives about exclusivity um, is that there's a rigor to it. <laughs> You know, it's kind of what you said, that in terms of, of certitude. Uh, there's a, there's a, I have a number of friends like this who are very much exclusively Christian. And that means for them, they have a rigor about their Christianity. They want to share Jesus with everybody. Um, they're the best evangelists the world knows. Their motives are different than my motives when it comes to evangelism, but, but that's a part of it. I'm still rid of doubt. Yeah. They know their identity. You know, they know, here's who I am. Here's what God has called me to be. Um, the one piece that's interesting, too, is that, um, and I don't know if this is a benefit or if this is a challenge, but, but that to think about God in Jesus as exclusively the way, um, the main idea that is faithfulness. So how am I faithful to Jesus? And that removes love as the primary um, relationship. So to, the measure of how you're doing is faithfulness. It's not loving or kindness. Um, and so that kind of brings us then to some of the challenges of being on the more exclusive end of things. Um, are there, what are challenges that you can think of when it comes to exclusivism? <clears throat> Again, not a bad thing. It's, it's, it, I can see why you read the Bible and, and get to that place. Yeah, Lois. I think that you it would be tempted to think that you would have it all together and everybody else doesn't. So, so think that you may be wrong gets thrown out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're more judgmental of other people. I think it can lead to more judgmental. I've got it right. Yeah, yeah. I've so, seen, um, I've seen, I have an exclusivist in the family, and I've seen her evangelize and um, shut down relationships mm -hmm. because of, I'm right, you're not. Yeah. And this is not just about interfaith, by the way. This is about all sorts of things that we can be exclusive about. Not accepting of other people. Not accepting of other people, yeah. It makes it really hard to have a dinner party. <laughs> if you have people of different faiths, if you've got, you know, it's like that Adele, it's like that Adele SNL Thanksgiving episode. Did you guys see the Adele video on Thanksgiving? Um, watch it. Go YouTube it. It's funny. Yeah. Um, Carl. I think you said it well in your sermon today. Uh, at least what I heard, and that's it's all that you know. To me, Jesus is the key to the door that opens the door, but it's a skeleton key for all doors. There you go. Sounds like confessional pluralism to me. <laughs> <laughs> I made up a new phrase. I stole it. We're all alive. Yeah, yeah. Um, now let's think on the other end. Think about being inclusive, uh, open to any religion. If you're on the far polar side of being inclusive, what are some of the benefits? You get a lot more friends. <laughs> <laughs> you can feel good about yourself because you're kind. <laughs> you know, accepting, tolerant, you know, fill in the blank. Yeah, I mean, it feels less judgmental. Yeah. I think there's a possibility for a deeper depth of spirituality because you're open to so many practices and ways of being um, yeah, there's a there's a spirituality that can be gained because there's different ways to be spiritual in different different religions. Absolutely. 
Um, I think it's it's a, a little bit. Uh, I'm going to use a military word, which is hard around this, but it's disarming. You know that that I don't have to be a defender of the faith in every conversation. To me, that would be a benefit of being on the inclusive side. Are there seeing good nods around? Are there any challenges you think to being inclusive or pluralistic? I think you're judgmental of the exclusive people. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to humanity. Yeah. Us, them. And so, well, how narrow-minded are you that you only believe in one thing? Like, being open to everything is the way to be. I mean, you know, it's like you have, yeah. you may say that you're not judgmental of that, but I would challenge anyone who thinks that they don't have a bias that way, if they're inclusive. Yeah. Yeah. Acknowledging the elephant in the room, how does Islam fit? Or does it have too many variations? Um, I think that... Are they exclusive? Are they... I would say it depends on the sect of Islam. I would say my experience of, of the Islamic society here in Milwaukee, my experience with uh, Islamic faith leaders, has been one of openness and, and real kind of um, interest in sharing uh, the particulars of their faith and also wanting to learn more about others. So so my sense is they've been very hospitable. Matt, can I just address that briefly? Yeah. We talk about Islam as as mono, kind of like there's just one Islam. Yeah. There are billions of Islams in this world. Mm. The ones that have been corrupting Islam has been a small segment of the Arab Islam. Yeah. You're not seeing this happening in Indonesia. You're not seeing this happening in you know, a lot of the Muslims who are living in Europe or the Muslims who are living in the United States. You're seeing a corruption of part of the Arab Islams. The treatment of women is an Arab Islam issue. It is not an Islam issue. And that is cultural to Arabs and not to Islam. Which is the majority of Islam. No. no. Yeah. Indonesia, Indonesia, Indonesia is, Islam is, uh, is the highest. But yeah. How many people but, is, but there's a huge conflict going on in Indonesia right now between the ultra-orthodox super conservatives that say the rest should be killed because they aren't orthodox enough. <laughs> because they're following, they're seeing what's happening in Arab. But, yeah. but if you look at the female leaders of the world, mm -hmm. a lot of the Islam countries have had female leaders. Yeah. Benazir Bhutto in Pakistan would be one mm -hmm. example. Right. In fact, the Quran says you educate women before men because they will influence the children. Right. <laughs> So in other words, what I'm hearing is maybe I'll learn a lot more about Islam, <laughs> um, which is a good reminder to bring questions for uh, in Shira next week. And, and, so, but so here's my question from the group. Do you think the Quran ever speaks of Jesus? It does. Yes. Yes. It tells every Jesus parable in the Quran. Right. Yeah. And a lot of the flood stories are there too. Right. Uh, the Old it Testament, the God of Genesis Abraham. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when a cleric uh, speaks of, of Jesus or Muhammad, they always say, peace be upon him. It's a matter of respect. And to piggyback what Darla said, when you go back to the beginning of Islam uh, with Muhammad, uh, you have not only uh, Arabs, but you have different Arab kingdoms. As a matter of fact, if you look at stamps from Jordan, it still says the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. Mm -hmm. So in different areas, Syria, Iraq, uh, Kuwait, uh, Iran, you have different kingdoms who, who think a little bit differently than the other kingdoms and they're constantly discussing as who should be the leadership in Islam. Should it be a, a cleric that they elect? Should it be someone who can show his relationship, his ancestry back to the prophet Muhammad? And this is where they differ, and sometimes they become violent with one another. It's it's not a pleasant situation when you talk to someone like my sit my uh, relationship with Mahmoud, or he likes to be called Mac. His he likes to Americanize his first name. I probably would too if I were. We've been you know, over ten years of conversation. I've learned a lot about Islam, and he is very, very uh, concerned about some of the things that are happening amongst different tribes and different kingdoms that represent uh, his religion. Much like you have Polish Catholics and Irish Catholics. They may disagree on, on a number of different things. It's the same thing. Yeah, so we do ourselves a disservice when we talk about Islam as Islam as, as, without, as, without speaking to more particulars, absolutely. 
That's a great caveat for all of us. And, and as Judy was saying, we just need to learn more. <laughs> um, it's always a good, re a good way to be involved. Um, I want to think a little bit about what are some more of the risks or the threats or the challenges of inclusivity. Um, there's one more that really comes to mind in a lot of the theological debates, and that is uh, most people, um, most critics of inclusivism, <laughs> um, even if they aren't exclusive, but they're just not, not willing to go as far, are, are critical of the fact that many Christians water down Jesus. And so in order to be inclusive, what parts of Jesus do we sacrifice or give up? What aspects of our own belief in Jesus as Lord um, do we cast aside? Do we just kind of put behind us, like, I'll believe in this now, but if I'm going to be pluralistic, I can't. <clears throat> I'm seeing some nods that this makes sense a little bit. That, so that, that's one of the big challenges of being inclusive on the other end of the pool, is that we can feel kind and benevolent, but the threat is that, that we lose what makes us uniquely Christian, um, which is Jesus. Um, so that's why I like this confession on pluralism. I need Jesus, and I'm going to leave the rest up to God, is my, my short and definition of that. Um, and, and we saw that in the video last week, uh, or in the clip Dan had about all the mountains leading to the same God. Um, well, if that's the case, what, what is Jesus necessary for? Uh, so there's some questions as far as that goes. We aren't going to figure out how to answer those today. <laughs> um, but it's something to wet, you know, it's, and you can read, I've got a whole systematic theology book that we can go through and talk about all the debates throughout history, but that would be not worth our time. Um, <coughs> I do want to talk about this alternative. So we've got kind of exclusivism on the one hand, inclusivism on the other, and I would say kind of what I like to think is kind of my middle ground. If I'm going to believe in Jesus and trust God to take care of the rest, um, which is, I think, deeply faithful, but can also be a little reductionistic, I think. Um, and so Brian McLaren, uh, who's a really, I would say, a, an evangelical Christian in some ways and a progressive Christian in others, he kind of bridges the gap. Um, <clears throat> he's written about 12 different books. He, um, he's written this book called Why Did Jesus, Mohammed, Moses, and the Buddha Cross the Road? <laughs> Are there any answers? Any any uh, jokesters here? <laughs> My favorite answer he has in the book is, well, we go to the bar, of course. <laughs> Mohammed says, I'll have a non-alcoholic, and and Buddha says, oh, I'll I'll set aside the the uh, the Buddhist principles of moderation and have a mojito. And Jesus says, margaritas, baby. You know. <laughs> Moses is like, I'll have wine. Um, you know, no, that's not the, but, um, but one of the things that, that McLaren asks us to think about is, what if Jesus and Mohammed and Buddha and Moses were crossing the road? What would happen? Would what happened be what happens when Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, and Jews try to walk the road together? They don't stop in the middle. That's where the road <laughs> Don't stop in the middle. Yeah, and one of the things that he suggested, I think, is really helpful, is that um, one of the things we as Christians, especially in relationship to Jews, um, we are blissfully unaware of how often we are supersessionists, um, thinking that Jesus trumps Judaism, as opposed to what Jesus says is, "I've come to fulfill the promise of Judaism," so that. Um, there's a lot of our theology, that a lot of our hymns that suggest like, um, that we are somehow superior. So if Jesus and Moses are crossing the road, the question is, would Jesus say, no, nope, Moses, I'm ahead of you, I'm better, I'm going first? Yeah. <laughs> or not? Well, <laughs> we don't know. When we get to heaven, we'll ask around. Um, or what does, Jesus do, what does Jesus say to Mohammed? Um, does he, you know, bring out a sword and and go after him? Well, I don't think so. Um, and one of the things that, that McLaren says is that our increasingly multi-faith world is causing many of us individuals to have what we call a conflicted religious identity. So we know what our religious practice is, but we see the religious practices of others. Maybe it's through spiritual practice. Maybe it's through our, our co-workers. Maybe it's through our friends. And we go... 
well, how am I supposed to navigate this? Yeah. It's no revelation. It's, it's no revelation. It, but it's hard to know where we stand. And hard to know, well, what am I doing it right? Am I too inclusive? Am I too exclusive? You know, you can spend, you can spend a lot of time fretting about this. Um, and it's interesting that, that on the one hand, um, we go from kind of exclusive, um, we call it judgmental. He calls it hostile on one side. And on the other side, he has weak. You know, we give up too much of our faith. So you've got hostile Christians, and you've got weak Christians, and in the middle you've kind of got moderate Christians, and, and you kind of go back and forth over your lifetime, probably. And I know I have. You know, kind of, oh, I was, you know, I was here, I was really universalistic, and here I was, where do we go? And so what he offers in this book is a fourth way, which I like. And that is a strong and benevolent Christianity is what will help us as we engage in interfaith relationships and help us to love our neighbors of other faiths. Strong, saying we don't water down our own <laughs> religious experience. Strong in saying, this is what I believe. And not saying, well, I don't know if I believe this when I'm with my friend who's Muslim. And expecting them to say the same. It's saying, I'm not going to convert you. <laughs> um, but it is saying, whoa, this is, you know, um, so, so strong and saying not just seeding, not throwing um, the bathwater out, <laughs> but also being benevolent. And that's different than accepting. It's different than being hostile. I would say it's even different than being kind. But it's, it's giving our other brothers and sisters of faith benefit of the doubt. And I think when we think of the Islamophobia around us, it doesn't feel very benevolent when I am motivated by that. But sometimes I am. Um, and so um, the hope is that we can engage in interfaith relationships in ways that are benevolent, um, that are mutual, um, but that are also strong. So that's the alternative way. <laughs> now, how does that practice out? How do we live that? That's the harder part. I like the theological concept of it. Um, it still feels a little abstract to me, though. Are there any ideas you have as to how we live that out? The huge challenge is, though, in our... We can make an academic exercise out of it and say he says this and this guy says that. <coughs> it's good to get our thoughts broadened. But I think <coughs> when we really get down where the rubber hits the road, how am I right with God and how is things going to end up and what does he want of me? Because if, <coughs> if I... If I'm not in the right place, I'm in trouble. And where is that right place? Yeah, and, and for me, that's where Jesus comes in. So that Jesus says, I got you, <laughs> even if you aren't in the right place. So for me, that's where, that's where Jesus gives me the freedom to maybe make a mistake, <laughs> to maybe um, try to be benevolent, even if it's on this, you know, even if I end up saying the wrong thing. <coughs> um, excuse me. Um, and so... It means a couple of things. Um, and there's four ideas here of how do we have this dialogue in a way that's strong and benevolent. And, and so here are some four ideas. This is some ways I hope we can make it practical. Number one um, is have a position. If you're engaging in dialogue with someone about your faith and they're of another faith, know what your faith is. <laughs> Feel comfortable saying, here's what I believe. Here's why I believe it, and if you don't, that's okay. But I, I want to be firm in sharing, here's what I believe and why I do. And that can be true if you're on the exclusivist end, if you're on the inclusivist end, if you're up in the kind, benevolent, strong end, it can be anywhere. But, but know what you are, and don't lose that out of a worry about like, offending someone. Um, we will make mistakes in interfaith relationships. Uh, the other piece is, a willingness to listen. It is really hard to listen to someone else describe their faith and going, and not going in your head, oh, that's not right. Oh, that's not right. But well, this trinity is way different than that. You know, and so I think that for us, you know, if we can bring an openness to listen, uh, not necessarily that there's, that we have to agree with them, but I think if we, if we approach it with an, a willingness to be persuaded, not that they're right, but that there's another way that can be helpful. 
Um, the other piece um, that I think is really helpful is that it requires us to have a disposition of love. It's Valentine's Day, so that makes it feel like it's thematic. You know, that, that um, it means you want to try to make the conversation, the dialogue that you have, a sacred one, a holy one. It's that benevolent piece. <laughs> How do you have a conversation that is, that is loving? I've loved a lot of people who I've disagreed with. I don't know about y'all. Um, and then the last piece is this will take time. We aren't going to be able to have one hour meeting with a friend. We aren't going to be able to have uh, a one-time dialogue on Thursday at the Performing Arts Center in Elm Grove if we don't continue to it. You know, so, so I think whether it's with anything, when we have these interfaith relationships, you know, um, know yourself, be ready to listen, be loving, um, and be be open um, to taking some time in it. Yeah, those, those are all uh, good thoughts, and, and it would be a good um, way to approach things. But I think the problem that this world has is hostility that is occurring that sort of um, affects how people think. And then it's the hostile world that uh, skews their opinions and doesn't allow them to do the, the four you know, items you just mentioned. So you're, yeah. you've got, you're, the hostility um, trumps all the rest. And yep. so I, and, and fear enters into people. Absolutely, yeah. Um, someone um, said that, that it isn't just our differences that divide us. I think oftentimes when we get together with people of other faiths, especially Muslims, well, I'm different than you this way. That's not what keeps us apart. The fact that we pray in different ways doesn't separate us. And it's not even, um, it's not even the way we, we have different God or same God. Like that, I don't think, is what divides us. It's that in some ways we both have this tendency, Christians and Muslims and Jews especially, towards hostility. I think you're exactly right. That, that that's a piece that's hard to overcome. Um, in fact, our identities sometimes are too strong. Mm -hmm. um, and then that can get in the way. So again, I feel like we've stacked sand and it's all blown away now. Um, so yeah. I just want to say, I think it's a great point, Fred. And in every interaction, whether it's with someone from a different faith or a different walk of life, a, a great way I like to think about it is how are we alike in every conversation and interaction. We might be completely different people, but rather than focusing on the fear that revolves around how we're different and how you threaten me, and it's how are we alike. Yeah. Because we're all alike in some ways. Yeah, Chief. I think one of the biggest aspects of it is to do something intentionally rather than reactionary. Yeah, that's a good insight. To be intentional and proactive and not reactive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when I was at the anti-racism training a few weeks ago, one of our partners from Cross and I were at the same table, and um, and we really were hitting it off. And and I asked, uh, you know, um, her like, this is really nice. And I was like, but I was also aware I didn't want her to be like my token black friend. And she's okay. she's like, it's okay. I'm like. 85 different people's token black friend. <laughs> you know, and so, so it might be, the first step is to be intentional about surrounding yourselves with people of different faiths. You know, we live in a, in a part of the country that is still unabashedly um, a lot like us. Um, so it might take some work and some courage to do that. Um, the last piece I want to say, and then we need to break, because I've got to preach again, um, is that biblically, there's a beautiful gift of the Bible, and that is the Bible is not systematic. The Bible says many things on many topics, on many issues. And so I've got a page here, if you want to look at it, that gives you the Bible verses if you want to be exclusive. <laughs> and if you want the heaven hell thing, if that's, if that's more your bag, they've got the verses here. And... If you want to be universal salvation, I've got the passages for that too. <laughs> and I think if you read the Paul Lane lesson from today, you can be any of those three. <laughs> if you were in church, you know where I landed. Um, if you're going to church, you'll know where I land. But it's hard to use scripture when it comes to this stuff because scripture was not meant to be, in this case, a, a, a universal answer key. 
to how we do this. So if we read Romans, it says faith is really exclusive. And if we read Romans, it says faith is really inclusive. And if we read Romans, it says people are going to hell and people aren't. <laughs> and we read Romans, it says everyone's going to get saved. So where, where, do, what does Romans say? Yes. <laughs> you know, and, and so, and so we have irreconcilable differences within the same books of the New Testament. Um, but I think what we do know about God, again, leads me to land where I started. And that is the power of God that I see and that I know in Jesus is strong enough to overcome anything. And if that anything is not being a Christian, then I don't think that's impossible for God. But that's as far as I'll go. So um, thanks for your good feedback and questions. Hopefully we didn't leave things too unsettled. Um, and I'm really excited for next week. Um, I won't be here because I'll teach new members, but, but Connor and, and Shira will be here. If you have questions for her, um, come with them and, and, and practice our four rules. <laughs> May I make one plug for a book? If you're interested in seeing the commonalities between Judaism Christianity and Islam. Karen, Christus, uh, Karen Armstrong wrote a great book called One City, Three Faiths, and it talks about where we all come from, and we all come from the same God, and it goes through how it all developed differently. All Abrahamic faiths. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if anyone wanted to do a book study on this McLaren book, I think it's really accessible and easy to read. I'm happy to think about doing that at some point in the spring and summer, too. That'd be great. Um, I think it's, it's like 10 bucks on Amazon, so it's like the cheapest book I'll ever do a book study with. <laughs> so, but uh, I'm not through it all yet, but so far I find it easy and, and really provoking, and, and he's writing for primarily Christians, um, and so regardless of where you are, I think it can be a helpful one. So, thanks everyone. Uh, we'll see you next week. Go in peace. Thank you. <laughs>